Hey everyone, so welcome to my channel and today we are going to talk about how to do a proper swallowing assessment. We all get confused how to do that proper swallowing assessment, especially for patients who are admitted in the ICU. So a bedside evaluation of swallowing is quite difficult and uh, kind of, you know, new to us. So welcome to Orion Speechy and this is Shruti Satyan and I am a medical speech language and swallowing pathologist. So let's dive into the topic. So the patient might be coming with various complaints and the most common one is coughing or choking. Mostly they might cough while they are having water or any sort of other fluids like tea, coffee, juices or anything. And another common complaint is something is stuck in the throat. I feel like doing <coughs> all the time or my voice is just fading off whenever I talk. So there might be a swallowing complaint that is also associated with the voice issue they might complain of increased phlegm or mucus that is there in their throat and something is always irritating them or it can also be a stuck in the throat feeling like when patient is having chapati or rice some hard solid food and they feel like it's not going down it's just stuck at the throat level so that can also be another complaint so you have to specifically ask them what consistency do they have the complaint. Is it for liquids or is it for solids or is it for both of liquid and solid. If it's only liquid, it can be a matter of vocal fold paresis or palsy because it's easy for the water or any sort of liquids to just trickle down the vocal folds and into the trachea. If it's for solid, it can be related to some structural issues and there might be narrowing of the passageway. And if it's both liquid and solid, it can be a neuromuscular incoordination problem. So you have to understand what consistency they have the problem at and what are the main signs and symptoms they are experiencing and how long they have been having it. If it's a sudden onset of dysphagia, like in one or two days they have difficulty, something is stuck somewhere and there's pain while swallowing, it can even be a fish bone or a chicken, small part of a chicken bone being stuck in the laryngeal area. So you have to be specific about the questions you ask. If they have been having these signs and symptoms since a very long time, you can ask them about their meal history, what sort of food do they have mostly, if they are prone to having spicy food all the time, late night dinners and all, that might be due to GERD, that is gastroesophageal reflex disorder. So you have to take the case history in a very detailed format to understand just through the case history itself you can understand what might be the cause of dysphagia and what they might be experiencing. Next is the medical history, what are the diseases they have had in the past and have they gone through any surgeries, especially when there is radiation therapy involved in head and neck regions, there might be fibrosis of the muscular regions and this can cause you know dry mouth and stiffness of the muscles. So that can also lead to dysphagia after a period of time. Some medications can actually reduce the amount of saliva in the mouth and that can lead to xerostomia that is dry mouth which can lead to poor uh, bolus lubrication and also aspiration sometimes. Now especially medications like antihistamines, anti-nausea medications, then the medications drugs which are given for Parkinson's disease and even antipsychotics have this issue of you know reduction of saliva production. So this can even cause a dry mouth. Even people with diabetes mellitus, the drugs they are taking can cause a dry mouth. So once you have taken the entire case history and what are their complaints and then what all medications they are taking, what are surgeries or medical histories they have, then you can go for an examination. So you can see the patient right in an upright position and you can first start with oromotor examination. That is how are the lips moving, how is the nasal cavity and is there any abnormalities or structural abnormalities in the velum and how are they able to uh, move the tongue. So everything around the oral cavity and nasal cavity, pharyngeal area, you can check. You can go for a facial nerve examination. You can do this along with oromotor itself because you have to check the trigeminal nerve, facial nerve, then glossopharyngeal nerve, hypoglossal nerve and also the vagus nerve in detail the most. Now here first you can start with the lips itself. Lips, are they able to seal the lips that is close the lips in normal position or do they always, you know, sit like, is it like this? and if there is any drooling happening on any of the sides so you have to judge the oral competence of the patient and if there is any drooling next you can ask the patient to open the mouth and see if three fingers are able to be placed horizontally that means the patient have good mouth opening and the jaw movement is also fine ah 
but if they are not able to move the jaw much i mean if they are not able to open the jaw much that means they might have trismus trismus is a condition when the jaw opening is less and this can be because of temporomandibular joint issue or it can be an issue in pterygoid muscle and sometimes even patients post radiation therapy can have trismus Next are the teeth. Do they have all the teeth, or is there any missing teeth? So missing teeth can also lead to you know poor bolus preparation, along with reduced saliva. So again, reduced saliva is a common issue in most of the dysphagic people. And the major thing is the tongue. The tongue, if they are able to move the tongue laterally, up and down, curled tongue. So all this are going to help in you know pushing the food from side to side for a better chewing and a better oral preparatory phase. Next comes the velum that is a soft palate. You can try asking them to phonate g g g n n n. So if it's a proper moment and if it's not misarticulated that means the soft palate is moving well and that means the patient will be able to propel the bolus in a really good manner. Now coming back to tongue itself, you should ask the patient to protrude the tongue and see if there is any atrophy or fasciculation or any irregularities. So if there is an uh, fasciculations or there's a slight uh, movement, a vibratory kind of movement, that can be a sign of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS. These kind of disorders, even in Parkinson's patient, you can see there's a slight vibration on the tongue, like they keep on the tongue keeps on moving. So that is one thing. And another is if the patient is not able to move the tongue to either of the side and it's restricted movement, like they can do. but this side it's not possible that so they are not able to move to either of one side that means they might have hypoglossal nerve issue and this can be a result of stroke even people who are having facial nerve palsy they might have you know uh, buckle that is cheek weakness on one side so it's very difficult for them to move the bolus back to the pharynx because the entire food the residue will be present that is oral pocketing of food will be present and then you can do the visual examination of the entire oral cavity and even to the oropharynx and see if there is any ulcerations or some masses or if the tonsils are enlarged now all these can also lead to dysphagia here the person can have difficulty in swallowing because there's pain now this point of time you have to refer the patient to an ent doctor or an otolaryngologist and do not hesitate for any referrals at any point of your evaluation because that makes a lot of sense because you don't treat all the disorders by yourself right you need an entire multidisciplinary team approach so uh, these kind of ulcerations and all these masses need medical or surgical treatment and that has to be referred okay coming back to the assessment i get diverted at times and yeah coming back to the assessment uh, next thing you have to check is the reflexes and the major one is gag reflex gag reflex is when you actually poke on the facial pillars anterior facial pillars either sides and the patient gags right when you poke that means it's a good reflex but if you poke for a while and only then the patient is gagging after you know like in a not much intensity that means the gag is not enough it's not adequate and you have to check for both the sides not just for one side now next one is cough reflex cough must be uh, like strong uh, so you can ask the patient to voluntarily do a cough <coughs> and see how strong it is see that means the patient can actually um, eject out any fluid or solid that is going or trickling down to the trachea so that means they have a good glottic sensation and if they aspirate they're going to cough it out if they don't have a good cough then there are chances that that can lead to silent aspiration so you have to make sure the patient has got a good reflex that is a cough reflex next you can assess the patient's voice you can ask the patient to say e a and also their name and speak for a while so you can assess the voice quality it should not be breathy breathy means they might have a vocal fold paresis or immobility issue and it should not be too hoarse or very harsh then there might be something some sort of mass on the vocal fold it can be uh, maybe it's their actual voice and if the voice is too gurgly that is when there might be dysphagia there might be too much pooled up secretions or mucus or saliva itself and it's all pooled on top of the vocal fold and it makes the voice kind of gurgly and wet 
so this can later lead to aspiration because they are not swallowing well and the pool secretions are not clearing up so it can trickle down into the uh, vocal fold and down to the trachea by the way one important thing i forgot to mention before is that you have to check the cognitive status of the patient first whether the patient is alert actively present or is he disoriented and is not able to follow any commands and if the patient is oriented you have to ask them where are they what is their name who are the people who are present around them then another thing you can also include which i totally forgot is their meal plans like how do they take in food what sort of food do they intake and are they having oral food intake or is there a peg present which you might not notice when the patient comes to the opd and or is it a nasogastric tube which can be clearly visible so the mode of uh, feeding should also be taken down and what sort of food do they prefer like the temperature variation some patients like to have cold food more some people like to have Have hot food more. So this must be taken into consideration, right? While you are doing the bedside evaluation of swallowing. And another is, did they have weight loss recently? Like, if it's a drastic weight loss, that means something is going on. So a great case history can actually project out a better result and a better diagnosis. So make sure you know what's going on in their body. make sure you know their past histories medical and even personal history and even food history whatever they are having and what all ha- they have issues with so this can actually bring up an entire good case history format and this is just part 1 there's more for bedside evaluation of swallowing this is just the case history and um, visual examination of the base and in the next part i'll be talking about cervical auscultation and also what is swallow trials and this is just the first part of you know bedside evaluation of swallowing next we'll see in the next one so i hope you enjoyed the entire video and i hope you got some information of the basic case history of swallowing so wait for the next one and let's learn and build our knowledge together